Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for being here with us this evening. Uh, my name is Sam Firio. I am the Building Decarbonization Outreach Coordinator for the uh, Building Decarbonization Team at the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, I will be moderating this session this evening. Uh, for those of you, oh, get my camera on, I think that'll help. Um, for, for those of you uh, that have emailed the Building Decarbonization Team previously, uh, I am the, the face behind the email, so um, thank you all for being here. It's uh, you know, We're glad you can make it. I know it's an evening session, so thanks for the flexibility. Um, so, you know, thank you again for joining, and, uh, you know, especially maybe for some of you who joined our session last week, uh, for joining, you know, uh, two of our BEPS outreach sessions. Um, we have a series of four here in August uh, and in early September. Um, tonight, one of our own from the Building Decarbonization team will be addressing uh, frequently asked questions regarding Maryland's proposed building energy performance standards. Uh, if you were not able to attend our session last week, that was titled, How to Get Started uh, Decarbonizing Large Buildings. Um, if you were not able to make that session, uh, you can find the session uh, linked or in the BEPS YouTube playlist on the Maryland Department of the Environment's uh, YouTube page. Um, so if you weren't able to catch that session, that's there on YouTube. We'll also be uploading all of our sessions uh, this month and in, in September uh, to the YouTube page, uh, including next week's session, um, Clean Buildings for All, Leaving No One Behind, featuring uh, Miss Price from uh, the Maryland Energy Administration. Uh, so that is next Thursday, the 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, and also uh, this series with Dr. Decarb uh, will become a re recurring series as well um, as we receive more questions uh, related to the proposed building energy performance standards. Um, and the Clean Buildings for All series with Miss Price will also of the recurring series as well. Um, so just a little bit of background for this session this evening. Um, like I said, I'm the face behind the BEPS email and our building decarbonization team um, has been fielding a wide array of questions uh, from stakeholders uh, via the BEPS email and during uh, other types of engagement hosted by uh, MDE. Um, and some of the questions you're gonna see tonight are uh, some of the top hits that um, we have received over, uh, you know, BEPS engagement, throughout BEPS engagement. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, take a second to introduce some of our um, celebrities this evening. Um, Dr. Zach Brizola, Building Decarbonization Section Head um, for the Building Decarbonization Team. I think you can see him there in his white coat, uh, and that is Dr. Decarb. He will be answering um, the questions uh, that we've received this evening. Um, also, we'll introduce Allison Jaden, Special Projects Manager uh, for the uh, Maryland Department of the Environment Climate Change Program, um, who may jump in during the Q&A portion of this session, which will be towards the end. Um, so. This session will be recorded, like I said, and uploaded to the BEPS YouTube playlist if you miss anything. Um, and chat has been disabled, uh, but if you're interested in submitting a question for the Q&A portion of this, this webinar, uh, you can do so by clicking the square triangle circle button at the bottom right hand corner of the page. Sorry, I don't have a more technical name for that button, um, but if you click on it, You'll see a Q&A button and you can uh, submit your questions in there and um, we will work to uh, address them during the Q&A portion. Uh, we might not have time to address everyone's questions, but um, you can always submit them uh, to our team via our email, which we will plug later. Uh, we'll work to get you answers for them or during other engagement sessions that we host. Um, so before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Decarb, Dr. Zach Brizola, I'm just going to introduce uh, 
uh, our bitmojis for this e evening that you can see on the title slide here. Um, Dr. Decarb, obviously, on the left, uh, and Mary Lynn, building owner, on the right. Um, and uh, just want you to hold uh, those names in your mind and the bitmojis as we move throughout the presentation because they will uh, have different series of interactions uh, on certain slides. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to, to Zach Brizola to get us move in. Um, yeah, go ahead, Zach. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Well, good evening, everyone. Before we dive in, I just, if you require an overview of BEPS, as Sam mentioned, you know, go on the building uh, on the BEPS website uh, where you can find previous webinars and technical documentation. You can also find this on the YouTube playlist. And you can access the website by scanning the QR code on the left side of your screen or by searching for Maryland BEPS in Google. If you would like to be added to our email list, you can do so by scanning the QR code on the right side of your screen. You can, that's probably actually reversed for you. Anyway, right side definitely. I don't know if my hand motions work though. Uh, you can also find a recording of last week's sessions uh, on, the, on the playlist. If you, and as Sam said, feel free to email us, but putting things in the chat or in the Q&A for this session, again, if we don't get to it in this session, we'll use that to inform future Q&A. So uh, don't, don't feel like we're leaving you out. We'll definitely try to get to as many as we can tonight and whatever else we'll bring forward into future Q&A sessions. And if you need to reach us, that's our email uh, and phone number. So let's get started. Sam, what's our first question? All right. Well, here's a list of questions for you. Um, it's a quick agenda, but uh, first question for you, Dr. Decarb, is what does a covered building look like? Yes, this is a great question. Let's first start with defining what a covered building is. It refers to a building that's covered by the BEPS regulation. That means it needs to be 35,000 square feet or larger, excluding the parking garage area. So what, what exactly does 35,000 square feet look like? You might not be able to tell just by looking at a building right off the bat, but here's some good numbers to get you a sense and grounding. Your average house, single family home in the US is about 2,400 square feet, so a lot smaller. And you know, again, just thinking back to what is a square foot itself? Well, if you take the length by the width and you multiply them together, that is a square foot. So a kitchen that might be 10 feet long and six feet wide is 60 square feet. But what does this actually look like in the real world? You can think about these as warehouses or a big strip mall or large multifamily apartment buildings or office buildings. These are big buildings. Your average non-super center grocery store, like a Weiss or a Giant, those are often about 40,000, 50,000 square feet. An acre of land is just over 43,000 square feet. And a football field is 57,600 square feet. But you can also get square footage by going up because this is the gross floor area. And so tall buildings uh, that, you know, maybe one that's a thousand square feet on the bottom, but 35, 35 stories tall would also be 35,000 square feet and something in the middle. So that's giving you a sense of what 35,000 square foot even means in the world. To be a little bit more specific about what is covered under BEPS, we include only commercial buildings and multifamily residential buildings. It's really important to know, again, we're excluding the parking garage area. So if your building is 35,001 square feet, but it includes 10,000 square feet of parking garage, your building would not be covered because you'd be under that 35,000 square foot threshold. Covered buildings are usually single buildings. But there are some situations that when two or more buildings are served in whole or in part by the same electric gas meter or by the same heating and cooling system where you have to look at the sum total of those square footage. And if that sum total is above 35,000 square feet, they'd be covered. And, and this is a practical consideration because we can't actually separate the two. They're kind of like uh, conjoined twins in the benchmarking world that we're getting to. So if 
they're also connected to a district energy system, that's separate. Those buildings are done individually. But again, for most folks in Maryland, uh, there are not that many buildings actually served by a district energy system. Covered buildings include multiple condo buildings all governed by the same board that taken together ex exceed 35,000 square feet. But you also might be wondering, you know, how does that delineation matter? Something we get asked a lot about is strip malls very specifically. And that strip mall is actually one building. If you, even though there are multiple units within that strip mall, if you try to take out that middle unit, the building would collapse in on itself. Uh, so that is not, those units are not buildings. They are that the building is the sum total enclosed by the, what we call in the kind of building science world, the building envelope or building enclosure. This is what keeps the elements of that outer shell of the building, you know, keeps the rain out in the summer and that heat you know, keeps your cool in. Uh, anything enclosed in that one shell for a commercial building, you know, that's a single covered building. And also there are some questions that there are some buildings, even if they're greater than 35,000 square feet that are not covered in the proposed BEPS. There are things like elementary schools, secondary sc school buildings, manufacturing buildings, agricultural buildings, and buildings owned by the federal government. If you think your building falls under one of these exemption categories, you'll be able to submit an exemption request once we start the benchmarking process uh, in the new year. So, yeah, that, that's what's a covered building. Thank you, Dr. DeCarb. All right. Next question for you. How do I get my energy consumption data from my electric and or gas company or building tenant? And what happens if they don't provide it? Yes. So we're, we've, we've left the kind of basics of what is a covered building. And if you haven't gotten this already, we're on a deep dive today. We're going into the nitty gritty details. So this is a nitty gritty detail and we can roll up our sleeves and get right in. So electric and gas companies, that energy consumption data must be provided to you by them when you request it according to the regulation. In fact, they actually have to provide it to you within uh, 90 days of receiving your request in 2025 and 30 days each year after. So once you've initially requested it from them, you have to have a handshake, we like to call it, with that utility to ensure you're getting all the right data. If there's three different meters in your building, you have to make sure those are all being reported. And, uh, and once that's accomplished with your utility, uh, you, they're going to provide you that data and provide it to you annually. So investor-owned electric and gas companies serving 40,000 or more customers, for example, BG&E or Pepco, or names you might be familiar with, the bigger companies, they must actually provide that data to you automatically through the benchmarking tool, which is Energy Star Portfolio Manager. That means once you've done that mapping handshake, basically every year it's going to pop up in your account uh, annually. And then you're just going to review the data, make sure it looks complete, and push it forward. And that's going to be the data you use to report your energy use and thus emissions to, to MDE. Now, if you're in a smaller electric and gas company or it's not investor owned, like Smeco or a local utility company for just your municipality, they're instead going to just give it to you in a spreadsheet. Never fear, you can just upload that directly into the tool. And they're using a, temp, a standard template that should just upload right in. And that's going to just give you the same data in a different format. But you'll have to get that from them every year. And they should provide it to you, though, still on that same 30-day uh, timeline. For building tenants, they must provide all requested benchmarking information that can't otherwise be acquired by building, the building owner within 30 days of the building owner's request. And that's written in the regulation. And if a building owner has a documented case of a tenant or utility failing to provide them with the required data, MDE, as the department responsible for implementing and enforcing BEPS, will work with you as the building owner to come into compliance and ensure that all relevant parties uphold their requirements under the regulation. So kind of thinking a little bit broader, though, a proactive approach to ensuring your data is complete and accurate ahead of the benchmarking deadline, which is June 1st, 2025, 
will help smooth this process out. Furthermore, there is a 30-day error correction period as part of that if, you're, if you find as a building owner that you can make corrections uh, if notified by uh, other parties. So that's a deep dive into energy consumption data. Thank you, Dr. D. Carb. All right, moving right along. So uh, just before uh, I ask this next question, just want to um, say to everyone again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them in the webinars Q&A feature in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. It's a square, triangle, circle button. You can click on that, select Q&A. Uh, we'll do our best to um, you know, address your submitted questions this evening during the Q&A portion. And um, if we if we don't have time to get to them this evening, we'll um, you know work to do so in future sessions or via the BEPS email. So um, please submit your questions there, and uh, we'll keep moving along. So next one here for you, Dr. D. Carb, is what resources are available to help building owners upgrade their building if necessary? Yeah, this is a great question. So from our preliminary modeling, we actually estimate that a third of the buildings in the state are already meeting the proposed net direct emission standards. But for those that aren't meeting those standards yet, there are quite a few pathways to help you as a building owner upgrade your buildings. The Maryland Energy Administration is expanding its online resources on a website called the Maryland Clean Buildings Hub. This website, also known as the Hub, amplifies resources such as trainings, grants, rebates, and loans from state and non-state entities. And it's your first place to look as you're trying to figure out what to do next. A link to the Hub's website just dropped in the chat. If you, uh, the Hub will also have resources on energy saving, uh, energy performance contracting, which is another opportunity to use low to no upfront cost project procurement through a third party company to actually do these retrofits for you and pay for itself with the energy savings of those projects. So that's a really good opportunity for a lot of buildings where they'll enter into an agreement, not have to necessarily put any money down to start and get their new building systems or weatherization work done and uh, pay for that over the lifetime of that installed system, saving you money. So that's another good opportunity. And again, that's one of the kinds of resources that the Clean Building Hub will also be talking about. Now, if you own a condo building, know that the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, provides substantial tax credits and forthcoming rebates to support efficiency and electrification projects for homeowners. The IRA includes both tax credits for qualified upgrades and up to $14,000 in rebates per household, depending on a number of factors. And you can use that towards any equipment you personally own and control in your unit. If you own a commercial building, you can uh, claim up to a $5 per square foot tax deduction thanks to the IRA's newly expanded scope. Even nonprofits can take advantage of this tax deduction through their contractor now. So you don't have to have a, li a tax liability to make this work. Thank you, Dr. Decar. All right. Question four for the evening. Can I use renewable energy to comply with Maryland building energy performance standards? This is a question we get asked a lot. And I just want to start by saying, you know, renewable energy has many be benefits. We're big proponents of it. And Maryland has several policies to support the growth of renewable energy in the state, including the governor's recent executive order to achieve net zero grid emissions by 2035. However, renewable electricity generation, and that's key, electricity generation is not included in BEPS. Here's why. BEPS is focused on the direct greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. These direct emissions can be visualized as what's coming out of the smokestack at the building itself. As a result, on-site renewable electricity generation or purchasing renewable energy credits or RECs for short, which is also commonly called off-site renewables, are not included in BEPS because they do not reduce those on-site emissions. If you have solar thermal hot water heating on your building, great. You're reducing, that's a form of renewable energy generation in a sense because you're generating heat for yourself 
and you're reducing the energy you would otherwise need to heat hot water for your building and thus directly reducing your energy use and emissions that you would otherwise have and include in your data. So that's an example of a technology that is included in BEPS. And that same goes for if you heat your building with a geo exchange or sometimes called low temperature geothermal or geothermal heat pump. These are all different forms of, of systems using the grounds heat to heat your building and cool it. Uh, those are really great technologies as well that very well could be good strategies to comply with BEPS and are very much included in the scope. That being said, uh, even though it's not going to necessarily help you meet the net direct emission standards, investing in renewable electricity generation both on and off site is still an important way to contribute to the state's overall climate goals and usually going to save you money. So keep those panels on your roof or subscribe to Community Solar to help uh, benefiting for everybody. Thank you, Dr. DeCarm. All right. Next question for you here is, my building is located in Montgomery County. What do I have to do to comply uh, with statewide VEPs? Yes, this one comes up a lot too. So we are required at MDE by the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022 to regulate emissions from all covered buildings in the state. And so that means those buildings in Montgomery County are also regulated by the statewide BEPS. And while Montgomery County regulates energy use intensity, EUI, and MDE net direct greenhouse gas emissions, we're coordinating directly with them to ensure that you can provide your data to both jurisdictions as simply as possible. Buildings, the good news too is if you're in Montgomery County, you're already using Energy Star Portfolio Manager to report your emissions to Montgomery County. And there are over 4,000 buildings in the state already using Portfolio Manager to benchmark, many of those in Montgomery County. So building owners are, who are familiar with that already, they're going to initiate data sharing with MDE through Portfolio Manager in 2025. And from then on are gonna just update their Portfolio Manager account every year and report that that data will report to both the county and the state. So we really worked to streamline this. Uh, we'll go into more detail on that process on our September 10th benchmarking working group. If you haven't signed up for that one, you can sign up in the same link you saw before, uh, or it's on the web uh, on the BEPS website as well. I will note though, again, there are different performance standards for the two different jurisdictions. So building owners have to be cognizant of those different standards when taking stock of where their buildings stand. We can go on to the next question, Sam. Thanks for that, Dr. Decarb. All right, question six. What changes were made between the BEPS regulation proposed last year, December 2023, and this new proposal that was just released on July 15th, 2024? Yes, absolutely. So the revised regulation that is we're now working to propose this fall it removed the previously proposed site energy intensity standards. And it modified a few different things, the agricultural building definition, manufacturing building definition, exemption procedures, the public infrastructure property types. And what that means is basically we just said, you know, if you're a wastewater treatment facility or a drinking water supply facility, you're exempt. And uh, we also clarified the consumer price index. These were all like everything besides the EUI were minor changes to help uh, respond to some feedback and, and clarify uh, a few different pieces. So I will say though that MDE intends to establish the site energy use intensity standards after analyzing 2025 energy use data from covered buildings and submitting a report as required by the FY 2025 budget bill for the state. So you shouldn't lose sight of site EUI and you should refer to the previously proposed standards as general directional guidance when you plan improvements to your buildings. So what that, does that actually mean? Well, we advise you not to install electric resistance heating equipment without considering how that equipment would influence your site EUI, and that might fall under future regulatory requirements. Thank you, Dr. Decar. All right, moving right along. Um, 
I'll uh, take a second just to plug my standard line here. If you have any questions, please submit them in the webinars Q&A feature uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Square, circle, triangle button. That's where the Q&A is hidden. Um, chat is disabled, so you have to submit your questions there. Uh, we will work to address them during the Q&A session um, at the end of the webinar. Um, and if we don't have time, we'll we'll um, work to get to them in the future sessions or or via the BEPS email. All right, that's enough for me. Back to you, Dr. Decarb, with your next question, question seven. Will there be opportunities to provide public comment on the BEPS regulation in 2024? The short answer is yes. As I mentioned, we plan to propose this in the fall of 2024. And when we do that, you will have the general public will have the opportunity to provide written and verbal public comments when the notice of proposed action is published in the Maryland Register. You will have uh, 30 days to submit your comments during that public comment period, and it'll come cul <laughs> culminate in a public hearing that you can attend. You can submit your comments to the BEPS email address that is up on the slide, provide verbal comments during the public hearing. We might also have a form, we're still working on that. Uh, but if you've subscribed to our BEPS email list, uh, which you can do again uh, from our website or by emailing us at this email on the screen, uh, you'll be notified when we issue the notice of proposed action and when the public hearing is. Thank you for that. All right, next one, question eight. Are there penalties associated with non-compliance? Yes, well, depending on the situation and the level and duration of non-compliance, penalties can occur. That being said, MDE wants to help you as a building owner come into compliance with the regulation. And we aim for all parties obligated by the regulation to be in compliance because we want our ultimate goal is to clean up the air and mitigate climate change uh, for all Marylanders. So we're really hoping to get everyone to work with this and we don't want to assess any uh, go after any non-compliance issues. So we're working really hard to engage everyone along the way so that we all comply with the regulation. Uh, we've already begun working with the utility companies and to provision all that data I mentioned earlier about your energy use uh, to building owners. And we intend to work closely with building owners to educate them on how to get into compliance with the reporting requirements. And again, that reporting is all that's required for the next five years. And so we're working really right now to make sure that folks are, are going to start reporting and, and come into compliance with that aspect of the regulation while also starting to think about the changes they might need to make down the road. So speaking of those down the road, starting in 2030 net direct emission standards, building owners have the option of making an alternative compliance payment in lieu of making the standards. I'll talk about this more in more detail on a later slide because there's a whole lot there to talk about. But for all other matters of non-compliance, the proposed BEPS regulation is an MDE Air and Radiation Administration regulation. And failure to comply with this regulation would put the party in question in violation of an MDE regulation, which would be handled by the MDE Air and Radiation Administration Compliance Program. The Air and Radiation Administration Air Quality Compliance Program works to ensure compliance at stationary sources of air pollution. That compliance staff conducts inspections, responds to complaints, provides compliance assistance, and pursues enforcement actions when necessary. And I just want to reiterate that is a collaborative process. Uh, and so they're going to work, we're going to work and continue to work with everyone to come into compliance uh, no matter the situation. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Carb. All right. Question nine, why do I need to have my energy data third party verified? And who is eligible to be a third party verifier? Having good data is really important. There's a common saying called garbage in, garbage out. And what we're trying to avoid is garbage in in this case. So because we're going to use that energy data 
and what's being submitted here to determine compliance and how our overall program is performing to meet the requirements in the Climate Solutions Now Act, we want to ensure all buildings properly benchmark. And this ensures fairness for all covered buildings complying with the regulation as well. So third-party verification is going to happen every five years. It'll start in 2026 with calendar year 2025 data. So not this first year that's happening that you're going to be submitting in it by June of 2025, but next year when you're submitting calendar year 2025 data. And that data verification, those third-party verifiers must have current licenses or certifications. And some and the licenses right now that we're planning to accept are professional engineer licenses issued within the US, licensed architects issued within the US, certified energy managers, building energy assessment professionals. But we'll also be considering this list over time. So if there's an additional data verification license or training program credential that we feel and, and is uh, argued is you know sufficient to meet the standards, we will consider it and add it to this list and make that available on the website. But for now, these four are the major ones. Uh, both M the MDE website, our BEPS website, and the technical support documents have more information about what's required in a third-party verification and a verifier. And we're planning as part of benchmarking and reporting working group to help let people know about where they can find out about these. And, and the short answer, if you're curious already, is that the uh, portfolio manager website has a really great search tool to find folks already doing verifi data verification. So that's where to look if you want to get into it. But again, you've got over a year before you actually really have to dive into this one. All right, Sam, back to you. Thank you, thank you. All right, almost uh, almost to the end. We've got three more questions. So, uh, and then we'll move into the Q&A portion for the evening. Um, question 10. Here you go, Dr. Decar. What flexibilities are available when trying to comply with the regulatory requirements? Yes. So before we get into complying, I, I mentioned this earlier, but there is a long runway until buildings need to meet that first interim net direct emission standard, which starts in 2030. So over the next five years, building owners need to report their energy use to, to BEPS, under BEPS. And so you have, you know, it's 2024 now, there is no performance standards to meet until 2030. So you have a little bit of time, you can take a deep breath and make a good plan, which is all about what this reporting requirement is meant to do. Figure out, assess where you stand today, where the standards are and come up with a reasonable plan and a timeline to make that happen. And part of that reasonable plan is that there's a bunch of different options and uh, other things for folks that might have specific situations. So once the performance standards are in place, there are waivers and exemptions available for affordable housing, buildings with low occupancy rates, and buildings in financial distress. Well, we covered those uh, a little bit last week, and they're also in the regulation. Or if you have more specific questions, feel free to email us. But as an additional option, building owners can, uh, for those that might not meet those, Building owners can also opt to make an alternative compliance payment for the greenhouse gases they emit over their performance standard. So we know that many building owners have a question about this alternative compliance payment. It is designed to provide flexibility for building owners to comply with the greenhouse gas net direct emission standards however they see fit. You can choose, building owners can choose to make the necessary upgrades to meet the standard outright, make only the alternative or make only the alternative compliance or likely do a mix of both to meet their specific needs. You know, we obviously want everyone to meet the standards completely without making alternative compliance payments because that garners the greatest emissions reductions. But realistically, we know that that last maybe five or 10% might not make sense for some buildings. And so you have the opportunity to make that payment instead. And we are required by the Climate Solutions Now Act, we also often get asked about the cost, we are required by the Climate Solutions Now Act to set this alternative compliance payment at no less than the US EPA's social cost of greenhouse gas. In November 2023, the EPA released a rule that set this fee at $230 per metric ton of CO2 equivalent in 2030. So Maryland's BEPS reflects this cost. 
let's unpack what that actually unpack what that actually means for an alternative compliance payment. So it's 2030. Your building emits 20 metric tons of CO2 equivalent from, and that's what the number that comes out of uh, portfolio manager. If the interim standard in 2030 is 15 metric tons, and and that's not actually how what's in the table. You'd have to go in the table and find, you know, your I'm in office building, and this is my specific emissions per square foot, then you multiply your building's gross floor area by that standard, and you come out to say 15 metric tons is my interim standard one. Well, you're at 20 tons, the interim standard is at 15. In that, you know, you probably maybe planned for this all along and said, well, I'm just gonna pay for those five tons. So I multiply $230 uh, by that five ton overage, and you're going to get $1,150 as your alternative compliance payment. Once you've made that payment, you are in com full compliance with BEPS as if you fully met that 15 ton interim emission standard. Each year after 2030, that price per metric ton increases by $4 a year. Again, driven by the EPA's uh, distinctions there. And so if that same building owner emits that same five tons over the standard in 2031, they'll owe $20 more. So $1,170 for that year. We are really in, want to encourage building owners to pursue efficiency projects and uh, decarbonization projects for their systems but we always want them to know that they always have the option to make an alternative compliance payment for their remaining emissions over their performance standard. That's a really important flexibility that everyone could take advantage of. Thanks for that deep dive, Dr. Decarb. All right, moving along, question 11. How does the regulation account for my building's unique situation? Yes. We get this question all the time. And honestly, I like to say there are 9,300 unique buildings here in Maryland covered by BEPS. Each building is special and so and a little different. And so our preliminary modeling shows that among the 9,000 building, 9,300 roughly buildings, there's you know a broad diversity. Buildings come in all shapes, sizes, and ages. And in a state, a heavily developed state like Maryland, we've got to think about that. So in terms of exemptions, building owners that believe they fall under one of those exemption categories I mentioned before can submit their request to the department along with supporting documentation. We will thoroughly evaluate every exemption request. For unique situations within your building that aren't otherwise exempt from BEPS, you can use that alternative compliance payment to meet your specific situation. We do not, in this proposed BEPS, require any specific mechanical equipment, building certifications, or anything. All we care about at the end of the day is what is your net direct greenhouse gas emissions and versus your standard, and maybe and if you've made that alternative compliance payment if you're over that standard. And so you can determine what's the most cost-effective compliance strategy for your specific building. And you know, we imagine that this is going to range the gamut based on every individual and unique building specific situation. Well, Sam, let's let's knock it home. All right, sounds good. We'll uh, we'll give you a softball here. You've been fielding a lot of uh, tough questions, but how can I learn more about BEPS? Yeah, absolutely. So. We are hosting a variety of different information sessions in 2024. We had, as I mentioned last week, one that you can find on the YouTube page if you wanna learn a little bit more about the basics of BEPS. You're here tonight, so you've already done a great job of learning a little bit more about some of our frequent questions. Next week, we'll have the Clean Buildings for All. Note, it is next Thursday, not Tuesday. Uh, clean Buildings for All, Leaving No One Behind with Ms. Price from the Maryland Energy Administration talking about the Clean Building Sub, among others. And we will have the Benchmarking and Reporting Working Group on September 10th. Dive really deep into that specific session. We'll also be announcing additional working groups via the BEPS email. So if you're not signed up for our email list, sign up. 
And those additional sessions will cover topics such as campus compliance, district energy, historic properties, and affordable housing. Those You can sign up for those uh, sessions, both the next two ones, as well as the future ones as we add them via a sign-up form on the BEPS website. If you have some more specific technical questions, we want to direct you first to our technical manual, or TM24-01, uh, which is on the BEPS website. And so that's the place with all the juicy details about how it's all going to work. So that's the place to start. If that still hasn't answered your questions, feel free to give us an email at beps.mde at maryland.gov. So this concludes our first set of questions for this edition of Dr. Deke Carf Answers Frequently Asked Questions. Let's move on to some of those Q&A we received. Sam, what do we got? All right, let's take a look through here. And uh, just um, time check, we've got about 17 minutes left. Um, so, you know, if you have questions on your mind, please feel free to put them in that Q&A feature uh, and we'll, we'll work to, to address them. Uh, it's bottom right hand corner, circle, triangle, square again. Um, feel free to submit them there. So let's, uh, let's take a gander here, see what we've been getting. All righty. All right. I think. We've got a good one here. Well, they all look really good. You might have some stumpers in here, Dr. Deco. All right. I think first question I'm seeing from Cameron, uh, covered buildings, does that only include commercial and multifamily buildings? Um, or does it not include government recreational buildings, performing arts theaters, equestrian centers, et cetera, uh, that are also 35,000 square feet? or over. So uh, is it only commercial multifamily? Or are there you know, government buildings regulated by this as well? Do you think you could highlight that for us? Yes, this is a great question. So commercial is a really broad scale. Technically, uh, that comes from this idea of the commercial building code, which covers a huge variety of buildings that you wouldn't necessarily think of straight as commercial. So there are many different building types covered by BEPS. There's actually about 90 different ones that are sometimes called commercial. And you can actually find all those different property types in the proposed draft regulation, which you can review online. Sam, do you think you could drop that link in the chat for folks, just so they have it right at their fingertips? Yep. And you know, I will say, I, I think you know, sometimes we get this question too about schools and, and why are schools in or out? And specifically those K-12, uh, pri you know, primary and secondary elementary schools are exempted by the law. So we were required by the Climate Solutions Now Act to exempt those, and that's why they're out. Uh, but otherwise, besides the handful we mentioned, uh, yeah, everybody else is pretty pretty well covered. Uh, and you can find those, those types on here, uh, on in the link. And if you've got specific questions, we probably, we're not really in a point right now of answering specific, am I exempt yet until we have a final adopted regulation? But we're happy to uh, get into those uh, uh, in the down the road. And if you need some clarification, we can try to our best in the interim. All right, thank you, Dr. Decarb, and thank you, Cameron, for that, that question submission. All right, moving right along. Uh, next question for you, Dr. Decarb, and I think I know the answer to this one, but I'll let you take it. Uh, how do I obtain a copy of the covered buildings list, and can they get a link? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if we can get that link to them. I, I don't have it quite at my fingertips, but I bet you somebody else on the team does. Um, it is available online. Uh, it's called the Appendix B Identification of Potentially Covered Buildings, and the, specifically the supplement has an Excel sheet uh, with the preliminary list of approximately 9,300 buildings across the state. Uh, that's where we will publish a final covered buildings list after the regulation is final. This was our first go at it, and we know there's some tweaks that we have to make. You know, we're missing some addresses and things like that along the way, uh, but uh, this is a good place to start. That being said, if your building is covered by the definitions in the regulation and you're not on the list, you're still required to comply with the regulation. 
Uh, that is the requirement. And so just because you're not on there, if you think you're probably covered because you're in one of those properties, you're you know not an exempted building and you're over 35,000 square feet, uh, we will have a form for you to fill out to get yourself on the covered buildings list and make sure you report. Uh, again, we're not doing those kind of am I in or out determinations right now, uh, but when the regulation is final and we publish that final list with any little updates, uh, that'll be the time to get some clarification. But again, if you meet the the, the definitional requirements of a covered building, 35,000 square feet or above, uh, and the, or one of those special categories, um, and you're not an exempt building, you should plan to comply with our uh, reporting requirements next spring and start to think about that 2030 road to interim net direct standards. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Carbon. I believe our colleague Allison sent uh, those links in the chat. Um, we'll also make the links available on uh, the YouTube posting when this video goes live. So uh, they'll be in the description of the video. Uh, if you can't grab everything that goes in the chat, um, they will be available later. Um, all right, moving right along and just say thanks, Khalid, for that last question submission. Uh, we appreciate you being here. All right. I think here's a, here's one for you, Dr. Carb. All right, from Hannah. Why aren't schools included in BEPS? And are any schools included? Yeah, so yeah, so no no K-12 schools are included. So because K-12 is specifically exempted by the Climate Solutions Now Act. Uh, but for example, colleges and universities are included. Um, so, and, and and the why is because of the requirements in the law. Thanks for that question. It's a good one. Thank you, Hannah. All right, next one from Louisa. Thanks for being here, Louisa. All right, Energy Star Portfolio Manager allows parking lot lighting an IT room slash data center energy use to be subtracted uh, if these uses are sub-metered. Uh, can these also be excluded from the benchmarked energy use intensity under BEPS? Yeah, so a great, question, a, a great question. And again, really in the weeds here, I wanna first start off by encouraging you to come to our September 10th benchmarking and reporting working group. We're gonna get into all of these exemptions and exclusions, um, but to kind of give you a quick answer here, parking lot lighting, uh, that should be able to exclu be excluded under our kind of excluding the parking lots in general, but IT rooms are in the buildings, that's energy use, uh, it cannot be excluded. Uh, exclusions, These, but if you wanna really get the full details, they're under BEPS, they're outlined in the regulation. And there are some funky ones that the that portfolio manager does allow you to back out, like cell towers on your buildings or a bill, you know, somebody rents the, your rooftop to put a billboard up and it's electric, uh, that can be excluded. Uh, those details are actually in that TM24-01. If you go up a couple of links, it's in there. Uh, we actually enumerated that entire list uh, of what you can exclude. But again, more details on that will come uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Dr. G. Carbon, and thanks, Louisa, for that and for being here. Um, all right, moving right along. Uh, time check real quick. we got nine minutes left. Uh, so if you have any lingering questions, feel free to submit them, um, and we'll uh, you know see if we can address them in the next nine minutes or uh, in future sessions. But we still have other ones in the queue, so we'll move right along. Um, all right, next one for you, if when you're ready, Dr. Decarb is, are data flows in the portfolio manager from our bill payment system, not the utility? Is that okay? Or would we need to switch to connecting utility data? Ah, actually, you're ahead of the game. It sounds like you're already getting the data. And if you're getting it in a format that you're happy with, you can choose how to access that data and so you're good, you know, as long as you're getting all that data together and it's all coming in nicely and collated, uh, looking good. So, you know, maybe more broadly, you know, you can choose how to access your data, whether through your existing payment system or directly through the utilities. 
Uh, again, big plug. I keep talking about it. Come on September 10th for some more on that benchmarking and reporting working group. Uh, but uh, whoever answered that question sounds like you're already ahead of the game. So keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, in the, a lot of the work with the utilities is intended for those folks that might not already be using Portfolio Manager that might need to get that data in the first time. Thank you, Zach. And uh, that was submitted from Anonymous. So thank you, Anonymous. Um, all right, moving right along. And this is a this is a good one. I think uh, you're going to hit this one out of the park. Next one up for you, Dr. DeGarb, is does net direct emissions mean scope one emissions? He said last week, thanks for this person for being there last week, uh, electricity is out of the scope of net direct emissions. So does that mean we don't benchmark our electricity from the utility? You're, uh, you're paying it close attention. Nice job. So correct, with a slight caveat, uh, net direct emissions are direct emissions from the building, so generally scope one emissions. Uh, I will note, if you're connected to a district energy system, which again is a small number of buildings in Maryland, those might normally fall outside of a scope one emissions by a standard definition, but that is included in the net direct emissions calculations for a building. Um, so if you're on a district energy system, uh, that's included. Uh, so, but in general, electricity from your utility does not count towards the building's net direct emissions. However, you're still required to benchmark your electricity from your utility as part of the overall benchmarking because we're required under this budget bill that I mentioned to do some reporting on uh, site energy use intensity and, and move forward with those site EUI standards at some point down the road. If, and so we need to know that data in order to actually move forward. So you still have to put in your electricity use because it's the second metric of site energy use intensity, which does include electricity. Uh, but again, to the core question, that net direct emissions does not include uh, electri uh, electricity emissions. Thank you for that, Dr. Decarb. All right, moving along here. Let me just take a gander at our list. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all right, so we got net direct emissions. Thank you for that submission. Uh, okay, next one up for you, Dr. Decarb, is in reference to, and this is from Khalid, uh, in reference to qualifications, for third-party verifier in the TM24-01 technical guidance document, how can I obtain a complete list of other additional types of data verifier licenses or training program credentials acceptable by MDE or where or posted where is it posted on the website? Let me see. Can they get a link? Yeah. So hey Don't Sam, could yeah, can we go back to slide to that question number nine? Yep. And maybe Allison, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, that that link. The so this list of what the licenses are are in our technical documentation in the TM twenty four dash oh one, and so the current accepted licenses are professional engineering issued in the U.S. a licensed architect issued in the US, a certified energy manager, and a building energy assessment professional. Those are the four currently accepted licenses or certifications. So those are the four. Um, and we will continue, though, to refine this list with stakeholder input throughout implementation. And so I would uh, basically just say, you know, again, these are the four. There's no further list, but if you want to see them in the regulation, it's in that TM2401. And so uh, that's the place to look. Uh, but if you have, you know, if you're really engaged in this field and you have some other thoughts on, on why a specific one uh, would be useful, we're going to have a third party verification working group down the line. And that'd be a great time to chime in and say, hey, I really think this would be a good 
certification and why, you know, how does it compare to these other two? And so uh, that's the kind of key, uh, key point there. Um, oh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, again, you can find it on the website, but these are the four as well. Sam, do you, right. I think we maybe have time for one last yeah. question. All right, sounds good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, here's the last one for you, Dr. D. Carp. If you are a covered building in Montgomery County, uh, do you have to reach compliance through MDE standards as well as MOCO's specific standards? Yes. Um, uh, Sam, I think, can you go back to that slide again, too, just to put that visual in front of folks? Sure thing. Uh, um, so the, the ultimate answer is yes, you have to meet both the statewide standards uh, because we're required to meet those standards and then whatever regulation uh, is, requ is required in Montgomery County. We're working really hard and doing our best to make it so that it's super simple and easy to submit your data as part of this. And it's good to know uh, as well that anything, so in Montgomery County, they focus on energy use intensity. Things to reduce your energy use intensity uh, means you're making your building more efficient. And all of those help reduce your total energy use. That helps you meet the net direct emission standards at the state level as well. So they do work together. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, looking like we're about out of time. Really appreciate you all coming. Sam, you want to close us out? Will do. Yeah, let me just get back to our final slide here. Thank you, Dr. Decarb, for answering all those questions. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us here this evening. And for those of you that um, you know submitted questions to us in the Q&A, um, just want to reiterate that uh, you know, sorry if we weren't able to get to your question this evening, but uh, feel free to submit it to us via the uh, BEPS email on the screen, uh, beps.mde at maryland.gov, or give us a call. You'll probably get me. Uh, it's 410-537-3183. Um, and uh, with that, I'll pitch, as, as Zach mentioned, our upcoming uh, engagement sessions um, next week. Uh, we have Clean Buildings for All, Leaving No One Behind, featuring Maryland Energy Administration. Um, that's August 22nd. And uh, and then, as Zach was saying, uh, September 10th, we have a benchmarking and reporting working group um, that I think will shed a lot of uh, light on the benchmarking process for you all. Uh, so thank you all for being here again, and uh, we'll end it there. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining.